And um, I'm excited that you're here to talk about manga. So I will first introduce myself and then I'm gonna take a little poll just to find out uh, more about all of you. Um, I am Dr. Sarah Evans from the University of North Texas. I'm assistant professor of youth librarianship. And um, I actually am from the Northwest, from the Seattle area. And I started working in public libraries in 1999, which if you know a little bit about manga is like the perfect time to be in a library. It was really the early 2000s was just when it rocketed. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to work with teens. I got to do selection. Um, and then uh, sort of overlapping with that time, I my son's elementary school didn't have a librarian. So I got to be a volunteer librarian there. And I spent a couple of years as a middle school librarian as well. Now I'm an academic uh, and I do teaching and research that is related to uh, graphic novels is an area that I do research around uh, in addition to other things around voluntary learning is my main topic. So things that you choose to learn and why you pursue them and how your learning is impacted by that. Uh, and then I am a fan of Japanese pop culture and East Asian pop culture in general. I do watch K-dramas and things like that. Um, so, but let's start with a poll. So the first poll, um, first I just want to get a sense of who's and your uh, knowledge level, you should see a poll, um, your knowledge level. Oh, this is fun, okay. Ooh, there's somebody who's here who knows a lot about Japanese manga and related media. That's exciting. All right. All right, go ahead and pull and share results. All right, so most people have a little bit of knowledge, you know it when you see it. Uh, and that's definitely how I felt when I um, started getting into manga. And I have a picture here of Forbidden Dance, which sounds exotic, but it was really just a book about uh, a girl who is trying to overcome her stage fright. She grew up as a ballerina and she joins a modern dance troupe. And so it's about, you know, sort of crossing lines, but I had grown up as a dancer. So my recommendation is if you've never read manga, a great way to get into it is to find a manga that is about a topic or around something that you're familiar with or a genre you're familiar with. Like if you're a sci-fi fan, then go for that. Okay, let's see. All right, I'm going to do, I also would like to know um, what age group people are working with. So that'll give me a sense of what people want to know about. Oh, cool. We have a lovely spread of people from all over. All right. Great. So mostly high school and middle school, but some people coming in from college or university um, and even preschool, people working with preschoolers and of course adults. So great. I will end the poll. All right. So uh, sounds like since there's a lot of people who don't know a ton, we're going to do just a quick whisk through um, manga history and understanding where it comes from. Um, one thing to keep in mind for sure is that um, people think of manga as Japanese comics, which it is, but they also can sometimes conflate it with Japanese culture. It is a big part of Japanese culture, um, but actually um, the manga as we know it now is really a post-World War II phenomena. Um, if you look at sort of sequential art before and after, 
basically in post-World War II Japan, um, televisions, while they were spreading in the US and other countries, were quite slow coming in. Uh, and so uh, it was a time when people were experimenting and creating this certain style of comic that really took hold in the popular imagination. Uh, Osama Tezuka is considered the god of manga. He created Astro Boy, if you're familiar with that, uh, which, or Mighty Adam, it's also been called. It was on the US TV in the 1960s. Um, and so they're serialized stories typically is how manga comes out. Uh, it comes out typically in like a magazine, which there are all kinds of magazines present that you can easily access in Japan. The most popular series will then get repackaged into um, those volumes that you're used to seeing on your shelves. So What's important to know is that it is the heart of Japanese entertainment industry in a way that is very different from comics in the United States for lots of reasons. Um, it actually, there 22% of all printed material is in comic form in Japan. Um, and movies and television and video games and collectibles and comics um, often interplay with each other. Um, some people say that an anime series is an ad for a manga uh, because a manga might, is typically can be longer running versus the uh, anime animation television show might just be several episodes, uh, but then you can continue the story. And another thing about it is that unlike if you've ever had to help someone who has seen a Batman movie and said, well, I want the book, um, then there's not like a strong match storyline wise between the MCU and the DC films. It's not like it's one specific book. There's very close alignment between like the different versions of them and, and characters are consistent and things are consistent. So um, people have multiple entry points and that's definitely come over to the US. It's also important to know that there's a medium for every part of society. And I think people get that now because American graphic novels have expanded so much in terms of audience. But especially when I first started working in libraries, people were concerned because they thought comics equals kids and manga has everything for from little kids to through adults. There's soap operas, there's sports stories, there's more high art or literary manga, there's pornography. Um, so it's it's everything, Any just imagine any genre of television show and you've got it, um, or any genre of movie and you've got it, that idea too. Um, it became popular in the US, uh, really started breaking through in the 90s, mostly through media franchises. So you probably uh, remember uh, Sailor Moon came to the US in 1995, uh, Dragon Ball Z came to 1996, Pokemon came in 1998. And so it really built up uh, into popularity because people saw this show and they wanted to read it. And then the big breakout stories were Viz and Tokyo Pop. And the reason that manga took such a strong hold all over the world, but especially in the US, was it was the first time that stories in comic format were produced and made easily accessible that were attractive to women. In fact, at first, Viz uh, early comics that had come over in the 70s and 80s, Japanese comics that had been translated to, in America, didn't do well because they were uh, put into comic stores and kind of hidden away. Uh, but once Tokyo Pop especially uh, made connections with bookstores and um, girls found them, it really became a phenomenon. Uh, there was that big explosion from 2001 to 2007. It did have a big slump in 2008 when Borders and other sort of brick and mortar stores closed, but it's been on the rise. And a current estimate I heard is that um, it's about 50% of the comics. And for example, uh, in 2019, uh, there was a 5% growth in graphic novels in general, but a 16% growth in manga. So um, it is a huge thing and that's why you have have encountered it. And feel free to ask questions um, and pop things into the chat or correct me if you're, there's something you remember from the manga experience that is different than that. So Scott McLeod has a, a wonderful book called Understanding Comics, which if you're going to do anything with um, breaking down and understanding comics in some sort of instructional way, I would definitely recommend that book as a great place to start. And he uh, really captured why 
everyone has become so fascinated with it. Um, the characters are visually recognizable. They're quite iconic in the way they're drawn. Um, manga pulls you in with a sense of place that previously um, didn't exist, particularly in the American market. Um, lots of different specific aspect to aspect transitions. Uh, emotion and ex emotionally expressive effects. Um, you can tell the psychology of the character by the way the panels are placed, um, the sound effects are involved, there's lots of little world details, um, and then there's a variety of character design. Of course there are certain archetypes, uh, the Sundere and um, different, that's a girl who likes you but won't admit it kind of thing. Um, and, and then it has a sort of maturity of genre because really it's been bubbling up and creative, create, having creative energy from the 1950s forward. Um, and he says, all of these techniques amplify the sense of reader participation in manga, a feeling of being part of the story rather than simply observing from afar. So as I mentioned before, the same genres of literature and film in the US you're going to have in comic format in, from Japanese creators. Um, there's also cross genre things. Um, one of the things that I uh, have observed in, and this happens somewhat in Korean drama too, is there's a Shakespearean quality. And what I mean by that, if you've studied Shakespeare or theater, um, of course, these were produced uh, for royalty to attend. But then there was also the groundlings, like people who could get in really cheaply. And so Shakespeare would often have multiple levels to his work. Um, so even in a drama, there's some humor and uh, even in something humorous or some serious emotional drama and you get that in manga. Now, um, there are four main target audiences. Uh, now, they sound, they are called boys, girls, men's, and women's, um, but both genders read across boundaries. And it's really, uh, it's two things that give that name. One is the weekly magazine that the story was initially published in that magazine is targeting that particular demographic. Um, and then also, as I say here, there are things that they become famous for. Action stories are well known uh, as a staple in shonen. Uh, shoujo girls manga, very relationship focused. Men's manga is more action, but darker, brooding. Uh, and then women's manga can be very uh, down to earth, but also, and, and funny in a lot of cases. So shonen, um, as I mentioned, action focused, uh, you see them often calling out moves about what they're about to do when they're about to attack someone, uh, humor, um, sometimes bathroom humor, sometimes um, like silly um, sexual humor, but very light. Um, it's typically characterized by having male protagonists, but that's not required. And in fact, um, one of my uh, most popular examples of all time, because the anime came to the US in the 90s and everyone loved it, was Inuyasha, which it focuses on this female character and her experience in this world, um, but it was originally published in uh, a shonen magazine. Um, lots of martial arts, robots, science fiction, sports, humor, mythological creatures. There's an emphasis on teamwork, um, which is something people um, mention that they like these, these kind of uh, relationships between people as if they're fighting squads together and, and having a lot of camaraderie. Um, and it's often that the protagonists are trying to make themselves a better person, which I think is another uh, attractor for a lot of people, boys and girls, this character who's trying to improve, you know, make their way in the world um, and have virtues like uh, sacrifice in the cause of duty and honorable service and family and friends um, that are exciting and interesting to people. So that's good. Yeah. So shoujo, um, like I mentioned, really um, took America by storm because we didn't have any sort of US equi um, equivalent. Um, if you know the history of comics in the US, um, sort of innovation got shut down in the 1950s and all comics had to be uh, age appropriate for anybody who picked them up. And so 
there really was sort of like an underground movement. It wasn't until the 80s where we saw the expansion in graphic novels. Um, and even still today, I don't, I, I don't think there's quite an equivalent. It is romance or relationship focused. Um, it's known for abstract images, these beautiful full page close-ups of characters' faces and their eyes and emotions. They're often sitcoms, romances, or relationship focused. It covers a variety of narrative styles, um, historical drama, sci-fi, the classic magical girl, which is Sailor Moon, who's empowered to do things. Um, and it, it typically will fe feature female, but for example, another, this is one of my favorite um, shoujos, is Natsume's Book of Friends, which the lead character is a young man who has the ability to see uh, ghosts or yokai, uh, these supernatural characters. And it's focused on sort of the trauma and pain that the, these particular creatures have had and him being able to help them. So it's that relationship piece that makes it uh, different. So Sinan is uh, men's manga. It focuses on action. There's political ones, fantasy. There's also more relationships in this um, than I think in the boys manga particularly. Uh, it's got quite a wild style, as you can see here. Um, for example, uh, Berserk is uh, very violent and sexually graphic. Uh, intense action series uh, versus Yotsuba down below, which is one of my favorite series for all ages, is just about a little girl who lives with her single dad and they live next door to three young women and um, they do camping and they go to the park and they catch cicadas and, you know, and it's a lot about her misunderstandings as a little like preschool age girl understanding the world. So um, I would say it's, um, Shoujo and shonen, the girls and boys manga can be, you can identify it pretty quickly, though there is variation, but the adult titles are have a wider range. And um, many of them are perfectly appropriate for high school. Um, it just depends on what it is. So once again, Josai has been, or Ready Kami is another name, it has been very slow to get uh, English translations. Uh, which is surprising considering how quickly and successful uh, shoujo was. Um, it tends to, instead of in the girls' comics, it tends to be like idealized romance. Um, in shoujo, it'll be a little more realistic. Um, they can have more sexual content, um, but that's not always the case either. Um, no Dam Cantabile um, is a, a series, in fact, and Honey and Clover are series that are set in college, but there's no sex in it. Um, so don't dismiss something when you see that that's necessarily what it's about. Um, some of them may have an entirely male cast, like this historical piece here, the Oku. Uh, and so it, there's a variety again. Um, but generally, it's um, thought of as having, you know, kind of down to earth, no matter what kind of scenario it is, even if it's a little bit magical, having more like having to deal with the real world kind of feel to it. And there are comics for kids called Kodomo, and they've definitely been brought over into the US. Um, Card Captor Sakura uh, is definitely one that has been super popular here. Again, um, my recommendation for anybody collecting a manga is to pick it up and flip through it and see what you can see visually. And don't go necessarily off the cover. Um, go where it was originally published, you know, and, and if there's age ratings from the particular publisher, which they used to have terrible, like not very accurate age ratings, but they've gotten a lot better uh, in the last decade. Uh, so Tokyo Mew Mew looks sexual but it's not a sexy manga. It's just girls get to be part animal and go fight and save the world, which is always an exciting feeling. So I wanted to share uh, some words that you come across when you're uh, dealing with different manga. Some are just some basic uh, different kind of genres. Those giant robots uh, or mechanized vehicles that you see, um, those are called mecha. Uh, if you remember uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which is um, the Americanized version of it, that's a Sentai where a team of people, there's no one hero, it's this team. Um, isekai has become so popular in the last few years. Think Alice in Wonderland, but all the implications of what that can mean. 
basically a main character character transported to another world. Um, Bishonen or Bishojo were the main character is a group of gorgeous boys or girls that a, a character from the opposite sex encounters usually and has to deal with them. Um, there are um, Shonen A or Yaoi comics is what you hear most kids say here. And it's um, boys love or gay relationship drama. Some of it, most of it probably is explicit, but that's not always entirely true. I just read a Tokyo Pop um, comic that was coming out that was really just about um, a gay guy in high school and his friend and who is straight and the straight friend trying to understand and it was very gentle and it was just about talking. Similarly, Yuri is a girl's love or lesbian relationship drama. So fan service is something that that happens. It tends to happen the boys ones more often where something happens typically like um, there's a skirt that gets blown up by the wind. Um, it has no direct relevance to the story or character development, but it's just to please fans. Um, ecchi is something that has a mild to moderate sexual humor. Um, and then hentai is literally pornography. Um, and unless you're working in a college library where you have a very special, um, oh yeah, Jennifer, I will post on the, someone just asked if they could get the screen list. I will post my slides on our um, channel, uh, which uh, we have that you'll get, a, you'll get an email notification so you can link to the presentation. Um, so anyway, yeah, so, um, Hentai, unless you like college collections, sometimes if they have like um, a collection of erotic art or, or books that focus on that, you may, may have that. Um, what's interesting about that and something to think about is sometimes um, there is a cultural sort of difference in what's tolerated and what's not. Um, and so uh, again, doing a little investigation, maybe not jumping to conclusions uh, when you check out a manga and see what's happening. Jojinshi are actually self-published manga. It's a very popular thing in Japan and there's been some movement for people to gather and do it here. Um, basically, and even like popular artists who have contracts in Japan will go ahead and like self-publish a story of their own because they, without like getting outside of the editorial control kind of experience. Um, a light novel, those have become more popular here than in when, you know, in 2000s, you never saw them and now they're becoming a thing. It just means a text novel, but is, is pretty heavily illustrated uh, more than we would expect. We don't really have that in between sort of thing here that's for different age ranges. A visual novel is actually a kind of game with illustrations and text and you, it's like a choose your own adventure. Light novels and visual novels are often made into anime or manga um, or, and, and all throughout that those they can change over. So um, Spice and Wolf is a series that started as a light novel, it's become a manga, it became an anime. It has all those kind of features to it. So um, sometimes there's some options for you. And then if you haven't heard it, kawaii is the Japanese word for cute. And moe is the feeling that you get when something is exceptionally cute. So a question that people ask a lot is, is it manga if it's not from Japan? And that answer is a little complicated, like everything in the world. Um, and, and interestingly, um, it's how fans respond, partly. Um, but at this point, because manga exploded onto the international scene in the 2000s, um, even uh, I was reading in uh, an article today about a kid from Ethiopia who was drawing in what people would say is a manga style, but he didn't know that's what it was. He was just imitating his friends and cousins who had gotten into manga and were doing that style of drawing. Um, so, but so for example, um, Ruby is a uh, anime series that was started here in Texas and they have some manga based on them, but a lot of fans say that's not a true manga um, versus Doki Doki Literature Club, which is a psychological horror game created in the US. People feel belongs to the manga anime game genre from that particular culture. Um, and then you have, um, for example, manga classics. They are a group that hires artists and writers in Asia, and they really make this effort to 
you know, get the people in Asia involved in taking then an American or British classic such as Tom Sawyer here and putting it in. And then for a while there are original, original English language or original uh, English manga like this drama con. They haven't done particularly well in the past, but I feel like now that people are getting more involved in it, you've got some really cool things happening. Um, there was a recent article in Book Riot about manga featuring black characters. They're primarily things that are created here in the US. And these two companies, publishers here, focus on um, using the manga style um, to uh, have stories created by people of color. So it's actually expanding in a really fun way. And people of all different identities can find um, joy in this particular uh, format and style. Um, just a quick mention on manhwa. Uh, which is a Korean word for comics. So when um, the popularity of manga exploded here in the US, um, they started to also bring in um, some Korean titles as well. So you may have read some. Um, it was marketed as manga, um, but what's interesting is because of the language differences, uh, if you've tried to read a manga for the first time, you know that it reads opposite. You're gonna have to read um, flip the pages, go from right to left. But uh, Korean manga was already from left to right. Um, so it looked a little different. Um, so there are less of those being uh, put out in paper form because what's really taken off is Webtoon um, and apps like it, such as um, Tappy Tap and Lezen Comics, which have their things here. Um, and so a lot of Webtoon is a Korean company and they are online apps that you can read or sometimes in your browser you can read a story um, and so if they became super hot in Korean culture and one of the things that makes it amazing is you can continually vertical scroll the story versus there are digital manga now but it's typically a, a copy or a picture of the original layout that was done on paper and then made digital. Um, and so you have to zoom in and out instead of having the story flow in a vertical. So if you've never tried it, they always have free chapters on these um, and sometimes even an entire free series. Um, it's definitely something you should try, especially Webtoon. And they have a lot of American creators who are creating in the Korean and Japanese style and things are uh, becoming popular. Cheese in the Trap was really hot because it became a Korean drama. Tower of God is now on Crunchyroll, um, which was also started in Webtoon. So it's another angle, another place of uh, East Asian pop culture that your students might be into and that you can explore. So um, why do I recommend using manga? Well, uh, it's high interest, as I mentioned. Um, there's a lot of information about manga out there, but it's not as centralized. Uh, and it's, it's getting better, but a lot of you're, you're going to encounter fans who are better able to help you navigate if you're not familiar with manga to find ways to find out about what are uh, important uh, particular like series that are important that might be valuable to pick up um, because you can't go to a central place like that has this is all manga reviews. Um, it's also a chance to recognize people's hidden information skills. Um, I think that quite often, especially now in the information age, there's sort of people both under and over inflate their ability to find information. And if you talk to a fan of any particular topic, um, but if you talk to someone who's a fan of Japanese popular culture, um, they may be able to um, show you that they actually do have a way of investigating topics and putting things together. And it's an opportunity for people to practice skills that you can move across settings. Um, a note about the word otaku. So in Japan, in Japanese, that is literally an offensive term that means you're so obsessed by anything that it's a detriment to your mental health. But um, American uh, fans took it up and other worldwide fans as a badge of honor. That just means you're a really heavy into anime and manga. Um, and then in, um, there's also a new term if kids are calling each other weeaboos or weebs, 
that's, um, it, it, it's sort of unpleasant. It's a word that refers to something unpleasant, but some are also embracing that as an identity. So kids change language, <laughs> language evolves. Um, so if you ever hear people talking about it, that's what they mean. So teaching with Manga, I wanted to highlight this particular resource, um, which is just great. Um, the manga visual pop culture and arts education, but it's not just about arts education. It also talks about um, manga as um, more about the content as well. And some of the articles are, are just relevant to Japan, but most of them um, are quite expansive and really quite enjoyable. Um, and of course, teaching with comics is not new. Uh, maybe you already have taught with comics. They've been used in the classroom as instructional tools since at least the 1920s, used for um, learning language conventions, examining humor, looking at politics, developing inferential skills with people, and especially, of course, as a motivational factor. Uh, in the inter introduction to this book, they have a lovely quote saying, manga, which consists of cultural information and visual, linguistic, and narrative art, is multidisciplinary in nature and therefore could be a crossroads at which educators of various disciplines come together, which I absolutely believe, which is why I'm doing this presentation. So thinking about teaching with it. So Obviously, one of the first things you can think about is uh, teaching art. <laughs> and these are a couple questions that uh, when people first encounter manga style, they can ask, like, why do the characters seem to suddenly become kids? Well, that's uh, a chibi, which I show here. And it's a way of a visual way of expressing the emotions um, or identity at that moment of feeling of the character. Um, or sweat drops and nosebleeds commonly show up in manga um, and people sweat in ways that they don't in real life, which you see that sometimes in American comics, but um, sometimes it'll just be like one sweat drop in a, in a Japanese comic. Um, and so exploring those, those visual symbols. Uh, and so um, Edgar Dale in the 1940s was an educator who talked about the cone of experience and this Japanese uh, Osama Sahara, uh, Japanese academic, um, has placed manga, as you can see, um, within this cone of experiences and how it's uh, almost, it's this verb combination of verbal and visual symbols. Um, and it does have its own unique expressive style in terms of images, panels, and language and how they go together. So those are great fun things to explore with kids. So it's also a great opportunity to teach narratives. And if you've never seen it and you're really interested in bringing manga into your world in a pedagogical way, um, Manga High by Michael Bitts is a wonderful um, story about a high school in New York uh, where they had a manga club, um, primarily African-American and Latina and Latino students and how they became uh, famous for their creations and they were this community led by a teacher um, that supported each other in learning how to express themselves and create quality material and interact with the larger community. Um, so I highly recommend that. Um, and so beyond just the art, uh, it is that combining of visuals and text to communicate complex ideas. Um, so I have example here, something that actually uh, I just got funded for a small pilot research project, looking at something called graphic medicine, if you're not familiar with that. And it's um, a movement that's been going for about a decade now that's getting stronger. It started with someone who was educating future doctors and wanted them to have more empathy for the experiences of patients. And so they used um, people's memoirs and narratives of health and illness. Because if you think about it, things that happen in your body or your mind can be very hard to verbalize. And so there's been some wonderful um, narratives that are able to do that. And so there are um, some manga that can be used that way. Um, several years ago, With the Light, Raising an Autistic Child had a lot of praise for um, addressing the experience of parents interacting with a child with autism. Um, this is a newer one, Dementia 21, about a home health care worker. And it's a horror manga, but it's more like the horror of like, dementia can be a horror experience for a person. So um, it's, I think that's one of the most exciting things about 
comics in general and definitely um, looking cross culturally in terms of um, teaching narratives. For example, with the light, um, the parent's experience of having an autistic child is quite different than uh, an American. So it's interesting to compare them. So having people even just having a goal that over a semester, um, I should have put that there. Casey has an amazing example. I should have put that. Um, I'll address that in a minute. Um, having, you know, over a semester, you could get someone to work on, you know, constructing a one or two page comic that's a vignette about a personal experience. You know, don't expect that they're going to create a 64 page graphic novel by the end of your semester, but um, maybe focus on um, really understanding it. Um, and Casey brought up one of my favorite anime and manga. It actually started as a manga, I'm pretty sure, which is Cells at Work. Um, if you have biology teachers, um, or any, science teachers, in your school or anywhere near you, um, I highly recommend them read or watch it. Um, and in fact, there's even a YouTube series where a British doctor sits down and watches cells at work and talks about how it represents in an unusual way, the different ways that our body systems interact. It's literally blood cells are turned into these little anime characters and they're carrying boxes of oxygen in different places. And then there's invasions. One of my favorite is the cedar pollen invasion and um, how the different systems, the histamine system and other systems sort of create this um, chaos and this flood. And so it's a great, great way. I yes, loved it. Yeah, yeah, Casey, it is a great, great series. Um, definitely highly recommend. So teaching culture is a very um, sort of like, I guess you could say an obvious thing to talk about. Um, a few years ago, um, Mr. Portress came up with this lovely list of things that you can call attention to when you are using uh, an anime um, or a manga. And so one of the, I put a picture here of like real Japanese school children or, and then people cosplaying, because something I've learned from um, Japanese teachers is that the sometimes American kids get real life and they think that Japanese culture is a lot like some of the shoujo and shonen manga that they encounter. Um, and if you've spent time in Japan, it's um, quite a polite cu culture. And sometimes in manga, you have characters, often in manga, you have characters who are not quite polite at all. Um, and so Japanese teachers have talked about having to prepare American students um, for that experience. So that's something um, you can talk about, like, you know, do, do uh, people um, view the Americans like the Simpsons? I mean, the Simpsons is a huge cultural export, right? Um, and there's also, um, social issues. My brother's husband um, has an award winning, it won an Eisner Award here, which is a big graphic novel award. Uh, it's such a sweet story if you haven't had a chance to read it. It's about um, a man who was a twin and his twin was gay and sort of went off and they haven't ta hadn't talked in 10 years and the twin passes away. But before he passed away, he got married to a Canadian and the Canadian um, once now that he's a widow, wants to go back to Japan and meet his husband's family. And um, uh, being a homosexual in Japan is not an easy route. It's very undercover. Um, and so this is, it's a very sweet exploration of like, how do you have a relationship, a friendship with people um, who are different from you and, and how things are um, conceived. Um, and then all kinds of things like, and I put a picture from one of my very favorite, probably my favorite Studio Ghibli um, anime, um, which is my neighbor Totoro. Um, but things like bathing is something that works slightly different in um, Japan. So um, they will wash the, you see people soaking in baths a lot. Well, they wash their bodies first in like a quick shower and then they soak in the bathtub. And that's not always something we do here in the US. Um, school customs, often in a manga or an anime, the kids are cleaning the school. And most American kids would be like, why are you making me clean the school? Because that is an expectation and part of the culture. So all kinds of things that you can talk about. And then teaching history can be um, really interesting um, because one of the things, if you didn't realize, Japan actually um, quite 
quite anciently decided at some point to close themselves off to the West um, in the uh, Age of Enlightenment uh, kind of era. And then they didn't reopen to the West until the mid 1800s. Uh, and so there's all kinds of interesting like history, um, manga and stories that uh, you can explore. And sometimes they're very light um, and sometimes they're darker. Um, Lone Wolf and Cub, I recently heard someone describe as the Mandalorian with the child. It's like an ancient samurai who's got this, um, got this baby has to take care of. Um, but then also 19th and 20th century is interesting to look at when the influence of the West came into Japan. And then looking at Asian views and, and American views of World War II. Um, and for example, this picture from this particular manga down here um, does not pull any punches about how the Japanese um, treated the Korean population when they were having their empire expansion. And there's still tension um, between Japan and China and Japan and Korea in terms of what happened in World War II. And so those are interesting um, comparisons and things to, to talk about um, with your classes. And really you can teach anything at this point in a graphic novel format and in a manga format. Um, in Japan, it's very common. So you have things like this actually came from a Japanese company like a manga guide to databases. And so they use, um, you know, art to help you understand these complex uh, things. And then there's the classics that have been put into manga. And then there's like little biographies and, and all kinds of things that you've probably encountered. I also wanted to point out that it's something you can use for an information literacy process. Um, so here I use a particular information literacy process. Um, if you have students who really want manga in the library added and you don't have a lot, turn it into an information literacy opportunity. Um, you know, you've got your task definition, give them some guidelines and um, have them do this work and then evaluate it and see what happens to the collection. It could be a really exciting way to involve uh, your students in um, and make like maybe make a manga committee and have them help you. So there's always the but what about um, because um, a lot of um, not a lot but in the 80s um, there were videotapes of like pornographic um, anime that came through to the US through Blockbuster and some other things. And so some people like that was our first exposure to Japanese style animation and manga. And so they're like, oh my gosh, um, that is not obviously manga is much broader than that. Um, but um, there are a lot of characters with large breasts. Now, if I was looking at a Western piece of media and a woman had an unrealistic uh, bosom, I might think that sex is going to be the main theme of this, but it's something that is just a character trait. Usually it's used like um, if a woman has bigger boobs, it means that they're like, they're usually the mature character, the one who, um, you know, is in control of a lot of different situations. Um, this comic right here is kind of a joke. Uh, manga made a self-referencing joke about fan service. She's trying to get to the fan and she falls over and there's her panties. So that happens. Um, and so that's another reason I'm like, if you're concerned about a series, flick through it um, and see what kind of things come up. Something that can be a little bit harder is an age issue or the lolly issue, which is uh, like Lolita kind of thing, um, is that sometimes they draw people, there's characters that are drawn that look particularly young um, for the purposes of expressing that character, that they're childish and like sweets and things like that. Um, so if you look here, the girls on the left, you're probably like, well, they probably are the same age as this boy who's riding on the shoulders of another boy. And actually those girls are like late elementary and Honey Senpai, the one on the right, he's actually a senior in high school, he's supposed to be. Um, so sometimes like if there's this cute little girl character kissing someone who seems 
15 years older than them, that may not be um, what's actually happening. Um, so that is a kind of just, they're kind of, it's a cultural difference thing that you get to, to talk about sometimes with um, your patrons. Uh, so in terms of building a collection, there's love, so many more resources out there than when I started in libraries, um, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and definitely, I just always recommend like having, what are your patrons asking for? Uh, what are people interested in? You know, just like in our book, regular book collection, you know, what's streaming right now that people are really into? Crunchyroll is a service specifically that's only anime, but Netflix and Hulu have a ton of Japanese properties. And then often people want to read the book because like I said, sometimes the anime just feels like an introduction to the book and you can continue the story. Um, uh, there are com some comic stores have gotten better about um, having some manga and some people, a larger comic book store will have like maybe an expert in the Japanese uh, products. Um, publishers, websites, uh, Yen Press, Viz, they're always um, advertising the properties that they've gotten from Japan. Um, and if you go to ALA, you can talk to those people and they're always very nice and fun e-newsletters. Um, there is such a thing as scanlation sites. So as I mentioned, things got really popular in the early 2000s and there weren't enough publishers bringing over content from Japan as much as the market demanded it. And so there was a lot of online fans would translate for each other and scan the manga and put them online for anyone to read. And so they're still around. It's not a great idea because they do hurt uh, the publishing industry as a whole if that's the only way you access manga. But for librarians, I feel like it's okay. Uh, because sometimes if a patron's just convinced that this series must come into the library and you're like, I cannot find reviews anywhere. Um, peeking in the scanlation sites, if you can find a copy to look at, can help you out. Um, and if you're a school librarian, one of my biggest recommendations is consider a four volume limit. Uh, for example, Bleach, one of the most popular boys comics in, of all time, you know, hundreds of volumes, Naruto, um, same thing. Um, and so often a public library can afford to have the bigger collection. And so you can think of just having a starter collection with some of the longer series. Um, and like I said before, flipping through and just be aware and prepared to talk about the fact that even though the kids are so used to, or people, especially kids, are used to manga being part of our world now, sometimes, because now there are original English language manga, they don't realize that these are produced within the context of a very different culture. Um, and so just being prepared to go, you know, I know that's really interesting. I need to find out about that. Or, um, well, in, in Japan, there's an expectation that students clean up the school. Would you like to help me this afternoon? <laughs> just kidding. Um, anyway, so that is almost all. I just wanna, um, point out that visual texts are increasingly important for us to be able to interpret and analyze. And, you know, there's all kinds of neuroscience coming out. Um, and there's these theories that are, you know, looking at dual coding and how we encode verbal and visual information and how important it is for us to be able to um, move through those. And manga is not going anywhere. And the style has become so influential in visual storytelling that um, people are going to keep using it. And so um, it's definitely something that, you know, we don't just have to consider as something the kids are always talking about, Well, we can learn a little bit about it, learn with them, and use it in our curriculum as well. Um, so before I turn off the slides and take any questions um, for the last 10 minutes, I just want to mention that we at UNT and TWU are hosting the 49th Annual Conference of the International Association of School Librarianship. And so it will be virtual in July. And uh, we really, really want everyone to try to join us. It's, kind of, it's a neat opportunity to have this conference online um, and meet with school librarians from all over the world. Definitely have heard um, from people who are very excited to present and attend. So. Uh, that is it. And then 
The next webinar is not until January, and that'll be Dr. Barbara Schultz-Jones, who's going to be talking about learning environments and best practices for today. So do you guys have questions for me? And you can, I think you should be able to, um, you should be able to unmute yourself <laughs> if you want to. If you can't, I can unmute you, but. Well, I don't have any questions, but that was really very interesting. My um, colleague had to leave, she has a class. Oh yeah. So. Um, That's great, yes, Sarah, but, you're joining from yes. Australia. Uh, yes. Oh yeah. How did you find out about it? It was just on Twitter or? Um, I think I found it on a Facebook group. Ah, uh, okay. And do you have so patrons who are, um, who are definitely looking for manga and wanting to interact with it? Well, we're actually quite different in that. I, we're a, a secondary school in a detention center. Oh, okay. So we, um, manga is very very popular um they haven't had a library here before for the last 10 15 years mm -hmm. i started in may so i'm just in the midst of organizing our library and we have two sites and an open site and a secure site we're on the secure site today mm -hmm. um so i'm actually in the midst of cataloging and putting everything on our catalog but um and so most of the staff don't have, aren't used to having a school librarian or anything like that. So um, I'm always looking and assessing and grabbing bits and pieces to, yeah. so that was one of our um, literacy teachers and she mainly looks after, um, well, virtually from about the ages of 13 to 17. Yeah. So, um, Great. Yeah. That's really exciting and definitely, um, yes, I know the struggle of trying to find ways to match up with the teachers. Um, yes. And so, yeah, yeah, manga. So this was really good because I don't know much about manga. I, I've, it's been in different schools. So it's been really informative for me in a professional manner. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or recommendations? Casey mentioned cells at work. I definitely love that. Um, there was something recently. Oh, Dr. Stone, which is a manga and an anime, um, is very fun for science and discovery and invention. Uh, the very silly setup. Um, the something's happened to the earth and everyone gets sort of frozen into stone into encased in stone and but they some of them start waking up like thousands of years later um but they're from the 21st century and so they're trying to figure out especially this one kid whose whole world is science um he's trying to like progress from the stone age to um to now um basically very quickly and so um it's these great they're like okay well first we need to get sulfur and we need to get this kind of metal and we need to get this to have these reactions so they'll have these maps that are like well we got to do this to get this resource to create that um and so it's very fun <laughs> it's a lot of fun excellent i've got a, a massive list of um things that i've been writing down Oh well. No one has any questions. You guys can can go ahead and enjoy the rest of your evening or day in Australia. Day? Yes, it is nearly it's about five to one in the afternoon. Okay. So this was perfect timing for us. <sighs> oh good. Good, good, good. Um, and someone, yeah, asked lists and resources as a place to find samples for various ages. Oh, Justin, yeah, Justin, yes. Um, and that is one of the nice things is that publishers are much better at it than they used to be. Um, and so you can, um, Diamond does 
contribute some things, but it's better to look at um, publishers' websites. And then like School Library Journal will come out once in a while and be like, hey, here's the new manga that are popular and you know accessible for these age groups. I know um, there's also, they don't have a ton um, of, I'm trying to think if they have, don't have a ton of manga, but there's no flying, no tights. Um, which is a famous website set up by the librarian um, Robin Brenner and they have a ton of reviews of graphic novels and they started at a time when you just couldn't find reviews of graphic novels. Um, I know it's funny to imagine now but um, but there was a time for that so yeah um, I get a lot of that from publishers I pay attention to um, I pay attention to some specific things <clears throat> um, like Otaku USA. Um, some there's a couple resources, my anime list and um, and Anime News Network, which have um, information about manga. So they'll have these. They'll have information about the property, like Doctor Stone, and then it'll say like you know, this was started to, it was started in 2014 and has this many volumes so far. It became a, um, an anime in 2019. Um, I'll tell you information. And another way really, especially for a lot of properties is Wikipedia can be super, super helpful actually. Um, and one of the things that's interesting um, about Wikipedia is helpful is um, often it will tell you what magazine it was originally published in. So it gives you a general sort of hint to age group um, because it'll say, it'll tell you like published in a CNN magazine, which means it was a men's magazine. Doesn't mean that that's a particularly out of control title, um, but it gives you a moment to think, okay, I need to find out more about this. Um, you know, and it'll tell you, well, this was in a, sh a shoujo um, weekly. It's, you know, so that's Wikipedia actually, I mean, I guess in part because there's a lot of very excited people <laughs> around the topic. And so um, they're out there editing the Wikipedia entries to make sure that they are accurate, so. Well, this has really been so informative and helpful. Oh, good, good. And I'll definitely um, post slides. Um, I have a question about different ways to catalog manga, recommendations for places that are just starting to buy these titles. That's really interesting. And I feel like it just came up. And so I'm going, maybe I'm like thinking back, I'm like, where did this come up? Um, I feel like that book list did an article about this recently. Um, I would have to double check. Um, this is a tricky question. I mean, first of all, how are your graphic novels in general being cataloged? Um, like, are they still all in the 700s? And, you know, um, sort of addressing the larger sort of question of like sequential narratives um, in terms of cataloging. Um, I can add, um, here in Australia, in my experience, um, we only put nonfiction in Dewey and usually any fiction of any type is always um, catalogued, no Dewey number. Um, my, my collection, I've genre-fied mine, so they're in different collections and obviously with the genre sticker so that um, it's easy enough for people to find and easy enough to shelve. But um, I'm always fascinated by um, people thinking that they would put any fiction in Dewey. I find it fascinating. It's just I've never encountered it in any library I've worked in in Australia. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know why um, it's been done here. So, you know, just um, something that people have done in the past. Um, I, mean, I, know, I know one thing is actually this currently we have, do you have GN author unless it's a serial? Yeah. And so what's interesting in a way, manga is slightly easier. And let me tell you why is because one of the things about um, if you, the DC and Marvel stuff is that the people involved in it change over time. And so like you have to, you know, make sure you include in the record 
who was the writer, who was the penciler, who was the colorist. <laughs> Whereas um, the manga tends to be like one mangaka creates it um, and, and that is who it is. Um, and so I know I was gonna see if, like I said, I'll, I'll try to put a link in on our webpage about it, but I think Booklist has covered, talked about that in the last couple of years. Um, also, um, Catherine Cat Can is an amazing expert on um, manga and graphic novels in general. And I thought, and she works for Brodart. So if you have a Brodart connection, um, you might look um, look at what Brodart is saying. Um, so knowing that she works for them makes me trust it <laughs> because um, she's been writing about graphic novels since the 90s. Um, and she really helped um, helped make graphic novels in general, but especially manga more accessible. Um, I'm just looking at looking at something she wrote, like she re recommends that you clarify that the book reads right to left in the catalog, um, you know, different things. Separate section library, popular series. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing, I, I generally have seen um, manga cag oh cataloged by the, the first word in the title, which is because that's the way patrons find it. Um, like, I mean, even myself, I'm like, oh yeah, I love Dr. Stone, but like off the top of my head, I can't remember the manga Ka who created it. Um, and so, you know, having them, you know, by series, um, by title um, is probably the best way in terms of like people finding it. But in terms of what needs to go into the record, I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, so, yeah. all right, <laughs> thanks, Kelsey. Um, all right, everyone, thank you for attending and I will, you will get an email soon with a link to the presentation. Bye everyone, feel free to reach out to me if you wanna talk about manga anytime. <laughs> it's, it's fabulous.